Fiber bundles are a tragically underappreciated kind of mathematical object, so I want to talk to you about them today to spread awareness of what these things are. If you've never heard of a fiber bundle before, by the end of this video you'll know what it is. First we'll start off by looking at some very basic examples, and then we'll take a closer look at a fancier example called the hop vibration. Okay, let's go. Cylinders are a pretty common shape, right? We all know what a cylinder is. But have you ever thought about a cylinder as being a set of fibers that are growing upwards from a circle? Maybe not, right? That's like, why would you think of a cylinder in that way? <laughs> well, anyway, this is a simple example of a fiber bundle, and we'll use it to illustrate the concept of base space and fiber and total space, and uh, then we'll move on to more complicated and interesting things. So in this example, the base, the base space, the space of all the fibers where they live, is the circle. The fibers themselves are these straight lines that just go straight up, and the total space formed by all these fibers that are growing is a cylinder. By the way, technically I misspoke earlier when I said the base space was a circle. It's actually a disk. In math, technically a disk is the whole area of the circle, and a circle is just the edge of the circle. One other thing I should mention is that I'm showing the fibers here as if they're growing, but for actual fiber bundle, the fibers aren't actually growing, okay? They're full grown already, they just, they exist. They live on the base space, and they fill the total space. I'm just animating them as growing, just to make it easier to see the individual fibers. The other thing you should know is that in a fiber bundle, there's actually infinitely many fibers, and they're all infinitely thin. So here I'm showing a finite number of fibers with some finite width, and you might think, well how does that really fill the space? Is each fiber a little cylinder? How does that work? No, no, in reality it's just that each fiber is infinitely thin, line segment in this case, and it continuously fills the base space. So in any point in the total space, you can figure out what fiber that point is on, and then you can map it, or you can project it straight down to the base space. Imagine what would happen if we take the same circular base space, but instead of extending fibers straight up, we extend them around in a big circle. Now what we're looking at here is a base space of a circle, fibers that are a circle, and the total space is a torus. Both the cylinder example and this torus example that we're looking at here are examples of trivial fiber bundles. Trivial meaning simple or basic or not super interesting. Uh, these, uh, they don't really tell us much, right? You might as well just work within a cylinder, work within a torus or donut. Uh, there's not much point of having fibers for these examples. But imagine what happens if we take this toroidal fiber bundle and we twist the fibers as we go along. We give them a twist. Now you get something interesting. Now you get something where the total space is not just the direct product space of the base and the fiber, right? So a trivial fiber bundle, you can pick any point in the base space, you can go along any point in the fiber, and that basically tells you everything you need to know. But in a non-trivial fiber bundle, there's some global structure to it, normally some kind of twisting or some intertwining, that makes the thing topologically interesting, and different, and unique, and not just the same boring representation of the total space. No, you actually get some structure there that you wouldn't get from just a regular old space. Alright, so now that we've developed a bit of a vocabulary, let's take a look at an interesting non-trivial fiber bundle that maps the sphere and the hypersphere. This fiber bundle is called the Hopf Fibration. <laughs> it's kind of hard to say, Hopf Fibration. <laughs> There's two Fs in a row that makes it hard to say. But whatever, it's really cool. It has a lot of interesting applications and connections to physics, so let's check it out. Let's examine the base space of the Hopf Fibration. So the base space is the two-sphere, also known as the regular old everyday sphere, the sphere that everyone knows and loves, like the surface of the Earth, allegedly. Mathematicians call it the two-sphere because it has two degrees of freedom, or two dimensions, uh, internally to the surface. Now it's embedded in three-dimensional space, but the surface itself is only two-dimensional. Latitude and longitude. One way of defining the surface mathematically, the two-sphere, is to say it's the set of points x, y, and z, such that x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. In other words, think about the Pythagorean theorem, the vector x, y, z has to have length 1. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, x, y, z, that's three dimensions. Yes, but the condition that the squares have to sum to one takes away a degree of freedom, so you're left with two dimensions. We can demonstrate this explicitly by defining a theta angle, let's call it our azimuthal angle, or our, our angle around the longitude of the sphere, and we'll let that go from 0 to 2 pi, or 0 to 360 if you prefer degrees. At the same time, we'll imagine an elevation angle, or a latitude angle, called phi, that'll go from 0 to pi. 
Now imagine that the set theta and phi span a two-dimensional parameter space, right? Bounded by 0 to 2 pi and 0 to pi. Well, you can pick any point in that space, and there's a corresponding x, y, z coordinate corresponding to that phi and that theta. And if you uh, do the trigonometry, you'll find that x is going to be sine of phi times cosine of theta, y is going to be sine of phi times sine of theta, and z is going to be the cosine of phi. And so if you look at the animation here, those dots on the outside of the sphere, those correspond to discrete theta phi points that I'm picking out of the parameter space, and then I'm projecting their position into x, y, and z. But I want to emphasize the point that in this animation, I'm just picking and choosing certain values of phi and theta to show you. I'm just, I'm sampling the base space. I'm not showing the whole thing at once because that would just be a huge, messy tangle of fibers. I mean, it already kind of is, right? But by sampling it and then by moving that sample around, I'm showing you, you know, you kind of have to look between the lines here. You have to take all the moments in totality and you can see how as we sweep along the base space, it generates these fibers and you can get a feel for how the fibers are all tangled together. Now that brings us to the next question. What exactly are these fibers anyway? Our fibers are a set of threads in four dimensions, specifically in Cartesian four space. So this first equation, f of alpha equals x0, x1, x2, x3 in R4. f is the fiber, and alpha is a parameter that runs from zero to four pi. You can think of it as a kind of angle in four dimensions. And then x0, comma x1, comma x2, comma x3, this is the coordinates of the fiber, as you go along this alpha parameter. And you can write out what each one of those components is as shown here on the screen. So x1 is gonna be the cosine of this alpha angle plus phi over two times the sine of theta over two. And the other coordinates have very similar equations, but you'll notice that the sines and the cosines change and there's a plus in some of the equations and a minus in the other. The thing I wanna emphasize here is that the phi and theta in these equations are actually the real, genuine phi and theta angles on our two sphere, on our regular old sphere in three space, three dimensions of space. And this alpha parameter, think of that as the angle in this four dimensional space that sweeps from zero to four pi or zero to 720 degrees, if you prefer degrees. And that is the thing that extrudes the fiber from the surface of the regular old two sphere out into this four dimensional situation, this four dimensional loop. And by the time alpha gets to four pi, it ends up coming back to where it started. So this alpha parameter extrudes the fibers, and they go wandering around in four dimensions, and by the way, at all times, they are on the surface of the three-sphere, also known as the hypersphere. And you can show that, you can prove that mathematically by noting that x0 squared plus x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared equals 1. In other words, the length of the vector x0 through x3 is 1. And so what the hop vibration is, it's a mapping of points on the surface of the two-sphere to circles on the hypersphere. Now the obvious next question is, how are we showing a four-dimensional thing on a screen? What are we doing here? Well, the first thing is we have to reduce it down to three dimensions. And to do that, we can use something called a stereographic projection, the equation for which is shown here. Basically, the idea is the first line is showing we need a transformation that maps our capital X four-dimensional coordinates down to a regular three-dimensional X, Y, and Z coordinate. The following line shows the equation for how we can do that. Basically, all we have to do is take the first three of the four-dimensional coordinates and then divide by one minus the fourth one. So in other words, we use that fourth dimension as a scale parameter to shrink down or to expand the position in space of these variables. That's particularly well suited for the hop vibration because of the fact that all of these circles are on the hypersphere and so they're all unit one away from the origin in four-dimensional space. Naturally, that lets us use that scaling effect to spread out the geometry of the hypersphere in a way that kind of lets us see what's going on. You may have actually seen the stereographic projection before. If you've ever seen a rotating tesseract that looks like what I'm showing here now, that's the same projection. So imagine a tesseract rotating in four dimensions of space, what I'm showing here on the screen are the edges of that tesseract mapped with the exact same projection formula onto a three-dimensional space <laughs> and then projected once more onto your screen. And so it's that exact same kind of projection that I'm using to show the hop vibration here. And that's what lets us see this beautiful four-dimensional bundle of fibers on a two-dimensional screen. 
Of course, one imagines that all of this projecting reduces down the shape. Uh, we don't get to see it quite in its full glory, but we get to see its shadow, and we get to get a feel for how it works. And of course, we can use the tools of math to study it and to answer specific questions about it. And over time, you know, you actually can, you can totally develop intuition for four-dimensional space. It takes a bit of practice, but you can. Anyway, there's a lot more to be said about the hop vibration, and someday we'll come back to the hop vibration and we'll do a video going into much more detail. We'll see, for example, how it relates to qubits and the block sphere, and there's a lot of cool stuff and actually some surprisingly practical applications for the shape. But uh, for now, anyway, I just wanted to show you a very brief introduction of it so you can see this really cool kind of trippy example of a fiber bundle. Allow me to end the video with a dramatic monologue. I want to talk to you about looking up at the stars. You know, looking up at the stars is one of the best things you can do for your mental health, and it's also one of the worst. Because both your troubles and your triumphs will be blasted away by the ineffable glory of the transcendent unknown. All of your fears, your insecurities, but also your triumphs and your pride pale in comparison to the magnificent orbs that illuminate the heavens. But did you know, in addition to the stars in the sky, there are stars in math. The mathematical stars are harder to see because they hide just out of sight. Not behind anything, not exactly, but more like between and beyond every moment. They're stitched into reality. They fill our universe completely, and yet they're nowhere to be found. Go looking for them, you won't find them, but they'll be all around you. And of course, they're invisible until you see them. Consider the mathematical stars that are now dancing on your screen. The millions of pixels in your device are material objects, and they're destined to someday corrode. But the structure that's choreographing them is beyond time. Well, it can be called into time, as it is now, but it is not of time. Once its dance is over, it slips back into the structured silence, and waits, without waiting, until it once again attracts the active light of consciousness. I do not know how that can possibly be the case. And yet, there it is, on your screen. Look at it go. <laughs> what a world. <laughs>